Hey there, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome to Law & Crime Network Live. This is our Q&A session where we take your questions about some of the biggest stories that we're focusing on right now. And today, we're going to talk about Tiger King and a little bit later on, more of the mysteries surrounding Lori Vallow Daybell. Now, when we talk about Tiger King, we're going to specifically focus on Carol Baskin and all of the theories surrounding what happened to her former husband, Don Lewis, who's been missing since 1997. Tigers, meat grinders, septic tank, Costa Rica. What is physically possible here? What are the physical possibilities of what happened to Don Lewis? Well, I have a great guest with me to break it down. Forensic death investigator from Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan is with us. And also we have with us executive trial producer, Kathy Rustin. Kathy's gonna be here fielding your questions. So whatever you wanna ask, submit them. We're gonna read them on air and then Joseph and I will break it all down. Now, Joseph, it's great to have you. It's good to see you again. And I want to start with the most popular theory, uh, that one that has been actually claimed by Joe Exotic, if anybody watched Tiger King, that this woman, Carol Baskin, killed her husband and fed his body to tigers. Now, is that possible? Is it possible to feed a body to tigers and there be no physical evidence left because there is no physical evidence that a murder was committed here. So let's start with the tiger theory. Jesse, I have to say, I, I never thought in my wildest dreams I would ever have a question asked of me like that. Uh, that's, it's mind blowing. I gotta tell you, my wife and I finished this series and I felt like that someone from Netflix had slipped into my house and put acid in my coffee. It was mind blowing to say the least. Yeah, it's within the realm of possibility. You know, these tigers are, they are man eaters. There's a reason they use that term, and uh, they require quite a bit of sustenance, if you will, just to survive on a daily basis. And I know that we think that we're slightly elevated above all animals out there, and this wouldn't happen to anybody, but yeah, it could. They see us as a meal, particularly if they're prodded in that direction. And I can certainly go into more detail relative to that, but just keep in mind, uh, in the wild, um, a tiger requires requires roughly maybe 80, 80 to 100 pounds of food per day. And I'm not talking about couscous. I'm talking about meat. That's what they survive off of. So kind of file that away in your memory banks there as we move forward. Okay, well, let's get into it. How exactly could that happen? You know, there was one of an offhanded comment that Carol Baskin made during the course of the documentary that people really seem to hinge on that she mentioned, you just dr drench somebody in sardine oil, the tigers will come flocking. Then there's the issue of the meat grinder. Can you actually take a body and put it through a meat grinder? So we'll get into the meat grinder in a second, but physically, how would you even get tigers to do this? Well, okay, you know, look, uh, I've, I've heard a lot about the fish oil and that sort of thing, bathing the body in that, and I'd, it gives me pause. Yeah, she had said that, and that's in order to kind of whet their appetite uh, in the zoo, and that's when they're being regularly fed. But let's explore another possibility here, and this is something that, that you know, as I was watching this program, you know, that kind of struck me, you know, particularly in light of what um, Joe Exotic said. Uh, I was thinking, well, how could you make this happen? Uh, you don't have to sprinkle a body with fish oil, particularly if you're a, a trained person that knows how to deal with animals, uh, particularly these meat eaters like this. Let me tell you how it's easily done. Uh, first off, uh, they're, uh, the, the keepers are very much aware of when these animals eat. I want the viewers to kind of reflect back. There are several shots in the show, and this was done on purpose by the producers, I believe, that showed these tigers in kind of a feeding frenzy, if you will. And remember, they talked about how food was diminished and all these sorts of things, and you've got these big cats that are running in there. What if, just for a second, uh, you don't feed these animals for, say, two to three days? Now, that's within the realm of possibility because mm -hmm. let's think about these animals in the wild. There are probably periods of time where they go without food. But, buddy, once they get their hands on it, particularly if they're ravenous already, they're gonna tear into it like nobody's business. So there's not even a need in order to facilitate this. Now, uh, one of the more shocking things that we saw on the show was um, 
the dismembered remains of uh, the cows that they would get from the market that those stand out in my mind you know where they're taking these large haunches into into the cages and they're feeding them to these animals and they're tearing them apart well if you can butcher if you can butcher a, a cow or a horse or any of these things which these people are highly skilled at doing i'm talking about zookeepers they do this all the time it's nothing to render down a human being a human being is nothing compared to the size of a cow. And I'm just talking about from a management standpoint. So you starve these animals out for two or three days. Say, for instance, you're thinking about this, you're planning. You're planning to make this person disappear forever and ever, amen. You chop them up into smaller parts. You have these arm, these animals that are uh, diminished uh, nutritionally, they're ravenous. Man, you put, this, uh, you put the remains right. in right. there and they'll consume it completely. Well, here's the thing. So, so there were still remains left of the, the carcass of animals. So if we get to the meat grinder theory, if you chop a body up into these little bits, okay, I understand how there might be nothing left over. Now, the documentary has been accused of being uh, taking this whole concept and really manipulating it because there wasn't apparently these big meat grinders on the property, but these small meat grinders. Carol Baskin right. took issue with that and said it would be impossible to even fit a body through that small meat grinder. Is that true? And it should be noted as well when we talk about the meat grinders. Apparently, the meat grinders weren't on the property at that point, or they had been uh, they had actually been moved before uh, Don Lewis's disappearance. So there's that separate question whether they were even there. But if we assume even the small meat grinders were there, could a body be put through that in that way and ultimately fed to a tiger? I can't believe what I'm saying, but I have to ask you. <laughs> well, it all depends on how much time you have. And yeah, the the smaller you can make uh, your dismemberment, uh, that is, uh, chop, it, uh, chop it up in, uh, where it's more compartmentalized, uh, for instance, uh, where you're only doing feet, you're only doing a portion of the leg at the time, uh, and then slicing that in half. Yeah, you could facilitate it through a small meat grinder. It just takes more time. It's not that it can't be done. You know, the purpose of a meat grinder is to grind up everything and i'm talking about bone cartilage and then not to mention muscle um and yeah it could be easily facilitated mm -hmm. it just depends on are are you secluded enough to do this do you have total and complete control over this machinery in order to facilitate that so that nobody's going to watch walk in and see you do it and yeah you could probably process a human body in an evening just using even a small meat grinder, but you have to be precise with your cuts. You have to get it down so that it's the parts are literally right. manageable. And, and people would and say, since things. that's their property, then they would, yeah. you would have the, the, yeah. the means to do it. I mean, clearly that facilitates that theory. Uh, I want to get to some viewer questions because I see them coming in. So, Kathy, what do we got for Joseph on the uh, Tiger King theories? Yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, the, and I like how he just answered. Joseph knew a question was coming in. What's the point of grinding the meat before giving it to a tiger? Um, I guess we addressed that by saying it grinds down the bones and everything. How about another question from our viewer? Um, how? Well, I don't know if Joseph will say this, or maybe Jesse and I can talk about it. How was Carol able to change Don's will to in case of my disappearance instead of in, in the time of my death? Um, and it says every state has different requirements. What do we know about that, Jesse? Right, so yeah, I'll just tackle this one real quick. Uh, the, the big theory here was that, well, she changed it to disappearance or that the will was changed to disappearance because he had been having these dealings down in Costa Rica, which were pretty dangerous. And to switch the language to disappearance because he had indicated that to her, Don Lewis had indicated to her, that you know, people disappeared in Costa Rica, it happens. So that's why that language was ultimately changed. You can change language in a will to be what you want to be. How being said that, to have the language of a disappearance is what makes this so unique. Uh, countless attorneys have said you don't really see that. Then again, Joseph Don Lewis, was he in the same kind of position as everybody else? And I wanna turn our attention to what we heard from the sheriff. So the sheriff of this uh, Hillsborough County He's taken a, a, a really interest right now in this because of based upon what's happening with Tiger King. Apparently, he's asking for new leads into the investigation, and he has his own theory about what ultimately happened. He came forward and said that multiple people were possibly involved 
in killing Don Lewis and obviously uh, having his body disappear. Now, we're going to play you a clip right now of the sheriff talking more about this Costa Rica angle. Take a look. Anyone who's watched this series sees how complicated and convoluted their lives are. Um, Don Lewis's life was no different from his business dealings, I should say shady business dealings down in Costa Rica, to having a girlfriend down there, to funneling money down there in small amounts, taking clothes down there for different individuals, uh, young individuals that upset parents with some of the um, sexual relationships he had there. I mean, it was extremely convoluted, uh, no different than, than in the series, uh, the, the, the entire case, but no, uh, it, it almost seems like our investigators at every turn encountered another obstacle. I mean, he had two security guards. And I'll give you an example. He had two security guards, both of them at the front gate of his property. They interview them separately. You have one saying, I haven't seen him in six months. You have another saying, I saw him last week. And these are two people, two individuals that work closely together. So extremely, an extremely convoluted case. The last dealings that we had were back in 2011. Um, we did offer Carol uh, an, an opportunity to take a, a polygraph. Everyone else has agreed and she declined. She said that her attorney told her it wouldn't vindicate her of anything. So she declined to be interviewed. All right, lots of breakdown there. But first, if you're just joining us here on Long Crime Network Live, we're taking your questions about some of the biggest cases we're covering. Right now, we're focusing on Tiger King, more specifically, all the theories surrounding what happened to Don Lewis, Carol Baskin's former husband. And then in a little bit, we're going to focus on Lori Vallow Daybell. I'm here with forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan. Joseph, you just heard the sheriff. And I'm curious about the Costa Rica angle, that perhaps Don Lewis was involved with shady individuals down there, described as the mafia there. And perhaps multiple people were involved in his disappearance. Does that make more sense to you than the Carol Baskin theory, in the sense that multiple people might have been involved in ultimately killing someone and disposing of their body? Uh, on one level, it does. And if he, you know, the sheriff, the sheriffs uh, always know a little bit more than all of us know. So I don't know anything about his shady dealings. But when we think about going to motive, you know, what would be driving this? And you've got a two, two horse race here. You got these individuals that are involved with him in these building in these businesses that uh, that Carol may not have had any knowledge of. And then you got Carol on the other hand and her compatriots, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what stakeholders are they and, and what do they have to gain? Well, I mean, the gains on both sides are pretty recognizable. And I think it all comes down to finances and that's what the sheriff will have to vet. And that's why he's trying to pick over all of this stuff. And Hey, Hey, look, man, unless somebody rolls over on this thing on the Costa Rica, angle. Um, I don't know that you would ever hear peep out of anybody, if, particularly if they're centered down there and they're in organized crime. This is a very sophisticated operation. It is business. Uh, you don't have like, uh, say, if you have an intimate event like this where you've got heartstrings attached, if you will, um, where uh, some people might tend to be messy, they can't keep their mouth shut, that sort of thing that's going to be problematic. Right. I've never seen a group of crooks, though, uh, or somebody involved in nefarious activity, if you get a whole bunch of these people together and keep their mouth shut, particularly since 1996, which I think is when he went missing. My hair was still dark. My hair was a lot darker then. Well, yeah, I, I mean, that's why there's so many questions about this and really what happened. And we're trying to get it to the speaking of questions. Uh, Kathy, let's go to some more viewer questions about possibly what happened to Don Lewis. Who do we have next? Yeah, Joseph, we have a question coming in for a viewer about the meat grinder and DNA. So if they were able to get a hold of the, the meat grinders and test them for DNA, um, with the human DNA possibly mi being mixed with the DNA from the cows or the, whatever animals they fed to the tigers, would they be able to discern that it was human DNA in there? That would, that would be completely dependent upon when they took possession of the meat grinder. And we're so far down the tracks now. I don't think that there would be any kind of viable evidence relative to that because it's not just how you handle it when you collect it initially at the scene, when you unbolt this thing and you 
take it off, haul it off to the sheriff's office, and you put it in evidence. It's how it's treated after that. You know, I don't know what the status of the meat grinder is. I'm assuming that uh, that it's in uh, someone's possession somewhere, but who knows uh, the viability of any kind of evidence that's there because DNA is so very fragile, and it's heavily dependent upon the environment in which it's stored. Keep in mind, we're talking about Florida. Uh, I'm from Louisiana originally, and uh, we share a commonality relative to environment. It's harsh, and things go really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking about multiple decades down the road from this event. I think that it would be very, the chances would be very thin. Okay, so we're trying to get into the realistic possibilities of what happened, and we touched upon the tigers, the meat grinder, the Costa Rica angle. Let's get to the septic tank. So one of the another theories put forward by Joe Exotic is that she Carol Baskin dumped Don Lewis's body underneath the septic tank. Now, again, if you read about this whole scenario, they say the septic tank wasn't even there when Don Lewis disappeared. But just so we understand, Joseph, the practicality, the feasibility of putting a body in or underneath a septic tank, is that can that actually happen, and how would that play out? Yeah, I guess it could. Uh, there's a famous case out of Canada from many years ago where an elderly man is uh, he's he's taking a turn with dementia and he keeps talking about how his former son-in-law is in the septic. Every thought everybody thought that he had run away, and it turned out they they pulled out the septic tank and and there he was. He was actually actually inside of the septic tank. This is something completely different. Let's think about what it takes to put a septic tank in the ground. Uh, first off, I don't know how proficient uh, Carol is at operating a backhoe and and uh, uh, a dump truck and moving all of the dirt that she would have to do in order to facilitate this, you know, putting in a field, which is what is required, uh, that's uh, uh, construction lingo that I am, I am not an expert in, but I do know enough about it. You have to build a field uh, for drainage. And then, you know, this, this septic tank is kind of placed in there it's covered, and it has to be covered in a specific manner. There's all kinds of gravel and sand and things like this that have to be laid down. It would take a couple of folks in order to facilitate this, and you would have to have mm -hmm. the right equipment. So, you know, my question is, is that would an, uh, would an individual that's going to facilitate a homicide, uh, would they have Confederates that were on their side that would be able to, I don't know, uh, uh, keep their mouth shut about what happened to this guy, not ask a question about, hey, why are you sticking a body underneath where we're going to seed this thing into the ground and then to cover the thing up and then everybody keep their mouth right. shut about it? Well, that's what we're – it's great what we're doing here is there's one thing to make a theory and then there's a one thing to say how could this actually happen? What are the steps that one would need to take and does it really make sense? Kathy, you know, I was going to go to Lori Vallodavo and I may do that in a minute, but I just want to take another question because I see them coming in. So what's another question that we have for Joseph on Tiger King? So one question was, uh, and I'll answer this, how come it took so long for them to start looking for the husband if he's been missing for so many years? This was a missing person case in the beginning. And, the, you know, allegedly there was an investigation done. Um, there's a lot of accusations out there that the sheriff's office didn't do much because Carol's brother worked for the sheriff's office. But this was originally a missing person's case, so there was a little investigation. But... Um, the question for Joseph is, if he was killed on site, so I guess at Big Cat Rescue on that site, is there a chance that any forensic evidence is left after all this time? Hey, yeah. Uh, okay, this is what you would be looking at. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we run into where uh, you have somebody that is killed and then left on site, many times perpetrators, sometimes, not many times, sometimes a perpetrator will do what is referred to as cocooning of the body. That means that they're going to take a piece of plastic, a shower curtain, an old tarp or something, and wrap the body in it and then bury the body. Okay. Now she's got a big piece of property. We can't forget about that. Uh, and so they, you know, I, I know in one part of the series, they kind of swept over, you know, with an aerial view talking about that the the personnel went out and conducted kind of a cursory search. But if you're going to search this thing and really do it upright, you would have to go in there and search this thing from stem to stern and uh, really cover every every bit and see if there's any kind of um, inconsistencies in the topography. You can tell where soil has been moved uh, many right. times. But again, we're many decades down the road. This is another point, too, that I want to, I want to make. Um, there's a body of water 
on this on this property as well. I saw it, you know, in some of the camera passes, and uh, it would require probably draining uh, that pond as well. If you're really going to do a good job, my suspicion is is that like South Louisiana and in this Tampa area, there probably there might be a, a, a distinct possibility that this thing would be inhabited by alligators. Again, you've got another alpha predator mm. here that would ingest the body. Now back to your question, is there anything left? I think that unless the body was cocooned, buried in concrete or something like this, it's not. Any remnant, let's just go with the tiger theory, any remnant would have been present, I'll say it, would, would have been present in the scat uh, or the feces of the cat, and that has long since disappeared. Well, I, I don't know if you're fuel, fueling more of the theories out there, Joseph, but it is answering a lot of questions that people have about what might have happened. Now, while we have a little time left, I want to switch over to Lori Vallow Daybell, again, the Idaho mother who has been charged in connection with the disappearance of her children, uh, seven-year-old Joshua J.J. Vallow and 17-year-old Kylie Ryan. Also, there's these other deaths that are associated with her, as well as her uh, current husband, uh, Chad Daybell. I, I know we don't have a ton of time, but I guess I want to ask you, Joseph, real quick, in about 45 seconds, how is it possible that two children can disappear? I mean, there's no sign of them. What goes into that? Uh, there, there is no chance that they're just going to vaporize off the, fan, the uh, face of the planet without somebody facilitating this. Uh, they're around somewhere in the most disturbing part, and I've been covering this for a couple of months in, in various media and, and on uh, uh, long crime as well. Uh, you know, those kids, I think, are in Yellowstone somewhere, and I got to be honest with you. I, I'll be, I'll, I'll be singing the praises if they're, if they're found alive. I don't have a lot of hope right now. We're getting into the spring well, fall. Well, up in I think a lot of people would. I think a lot of people would would ultimately feel that way as well. They want answers. They hope these children are ultimately safe wherever they are, and maybe we're going to get more answers moving forward. Joseph, I wish we had more time to talk about this. Kathy, thank you so much for fielding the questions. I appreciate both of you coming on. Uh, everybody out there, thanks for joining us. Stay safe. We'll be back.